Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, hello. I just managed hello, to get Sarah, it on. Yeah. Uh, uh, everything is okay from your side? Yeah, it took me a long time to get in. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Unfortunately, I, I'm not sure what's happening because uh, this may not be my normal Zoom. I normally have to go through my desktop. So there may, okay. be, there may be some differences. Okay, thank you, thank you, sir. sir thank you. Uh, so we're running late. Uh, so we're starting now. So unfortunately, the, the system has changed from what it normally is. So I don't know how to, let me see. Oh, yes, okay. <clears throat> So I go to screen screen share, right? Okay, can you see the screen? So please, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so sir, uh, sir, uh, uh, may I uh, go for the welcome address now? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Derek so Spence, know, uh, uh, distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen from social media, Facebook and uh, YouTube, this is uh, Rudranarayan Das, Executive Director CARD, Center for uh, CARD, welcome you all to this global uh, digital pl platform of intellectual gathering of World Human Sciences and Management Conference 2021, organized by Center for Adivasi Research and Development, Odisha. In association with Indian Institute of Management, Sambalpur, Central University of Odisha, Koraput, and Ravensa University, Katak, Odisha. The broader theme of this uh, conference is agnotological context, disciplinary practices of social sciences and policy frames. On behalf of Center for Adivasi Research and Development, I extend my profound gratitude to Professor Mahadeva Joyswal, Director, Indian Institute of Management, Professor S.K. Palita, Vice Chancellor, Central University of Odisha, and Professor Sanjay Kumar Naik, Vice Chancellor, Ravensa University, Katak. The convener of this uh, largest, uh, uh, the convener of this uh, largest virtual conference, uh, eminent Indian historian, Professor Chandi Prasad Nanda, and eminent policy activist, writer, and philanthropist, Mr. Charudat Panigrahi. Friends, uh, this evening, uh, a very wonderful and uh, finest uh, brain of this art will be with us. Uh, he is none other than Professor Marcus T. Anthony. Professor Marcus T. Anthony is a futurist, keynote speaker, personal consultant, and writer. Also, investigate deep features, uh, deep futures, uh, profound, meaningful, and sustainable visions for tomorrow. Uh, the specific uh, futures of uh, uh, Professor Anthony have researched and spoken uh, about include education, including transforming the Chinese education system, the development of China and Asia, the South Asia, the South Asia Greater Bay Area initiative to Hong Kong, uh, Shenzhen, Macau, Guangzhou, and Zhuhai. Uh, and another is sense making in the digital age, mindfulness, technology and the future, human and artificial intelligence, the philosophy of science, consequ <coughs> consequences and studies. Professor Anthony lived in Zhuhai, uh, Southern China and the associate professor of, of teaching features and futures, features and studies at the College for Global Talents Beijing Institute of Technology. Professor Anthony is also a future strategist for the CGT Education and Policy Research Center at the same institution. In today's webinar, Professor Anthony will deliver his talk on sense making in 21st century. Now, without taking much time, I would like to invite Professor Anthony to initiate his talk. Over to you, Professor Anthony. Ah, yes, thanks for that uh, quite long introduction. So if my understanding is correct, we only have a few people listening. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, we I'll are try... live in Facebook. What's that? We are live in Facebook. Oh, please continue. So, okay. 
So um, I actually, I don't know too much about your organization or how this is being set up, but uh, I will talk a little bit about my topic. I hope you can understand my Australian accent because I'm originally from Australia. Uh, although I've been teaching uh, in China and Asia for quite a long time. So hopefully my accent is not too bad. Okay. Uh, now, I, I'm not quite sure what the audience is interested in. So there's actually quite a lot I could talk about tonight. And I, want, I will not be able to talk about all of these things. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the things that uh, I get a sense uh, people are interested in. If I could somehow see uh, what people are interested in, that would be good. I don't know how you could communicate it to me. Maybe if you want, you could ask me some questions along the way. That would be okay by me, but uh, otherwise I would just have to intuit or get the feeling of what people uh, want. So basically there are seven things that I could talk about. Very briefly, I won't say much about myself. We already had an introduction. Uh, I'll outline the problem and some definitions. I'm also going to tell you what critical future studies is. Some of you may be interested in that. Uh, it's a way of trying to understand the future. I'm going to present four aspects of the problem, some useful tools and approaches, some ways they can be applied, and some limitations uh, of the approach, maybe at the end. Probably I won't have time to do the last one, but we'll see. Okay, I won't tell you too much about myself. Uh, if you're interested, you could find out a bit about me on the www.myinfutures.com. But the introduction we just had was enough, I think. So I'll skip that. What I'm talking about tonight is, is related to a research project that I'm personally doing, which I'm calling the Power and Presence Project. And it's also based on an upcoming book that I'm writing called Power and Presence. Reclaiming Your Authentic Self in a Weaponized World. Um, and I think it's got a lot to do with your, uh, your conference or webinar series. It's actually quite closely related to that. So essentially my topic is about sense-making in the 21st century. So sense-making, as it, as it suggests, is about how do, how do we make sense of the world? The world's becoming increasingly difficult to understand. And in particular, the rise of the internet and uh, information technology uh, and contestations of power and voice on the internet really makes it difficult for people to understand what's going on. Um, I'm not going to read all these slides, okay? I'll, I'll show them to you, but you know, there's too much information. So I suggest you listen to what I say. I'll just pick out what I feel is the most important thing. Now, the meaning crisis is the idea that it's a lot of people are confused about how to make meaning of their lives and uh, also and then the rise of information on the internet uh, the lack of perhaps shared and agreed meaning uh, in traditionally religions you know especially in traditional religious and spiritual countries including india uh, the religious context was the central meaning or shared meaning but not always the case anymore. And in Western countries, some other countries, China, that, that meaning is collapsing. So it's a problem. So it's becoming more difficult to make sense of the world. That's the problem. So how do we do that? Um, okay, so basically, there are several key issues, and I'm just going to pick out a few here. I've got 13, but I'm just going to tell you which ones are perhaps most interesting to you here. Um, the first point is that the trust in media and our institutions, especially in the West, is starting to collapse. Um, this is quite clear from surveys uh, that have been done and asking people, do you, do you trust the media? Do you trust institutions? Now, inter institutions basically means the traditional um, legal and media structures, information, education institutions in our society. Do you trust universities? Do you trust, um, I don't know, the banks? Um, government and so on. It seems to be that trust is starting to collapse in those things. It's quite clear. The rise of fake news is, uh, of course, uh, that term was brought to us by our friend Donald Trump, but it's a, it is a big problem. Um, of course, you can weaponize the idea of fake news as well. 
okay? Uh, the rise of virtual reality and augmented reality, which is how we add the internet and the internet of things to, to the world, is, ma is making this problem even bigger because that gives a scope for other people basically to get inside our heads and inside our hearts. Uh, not just governments, uh, can be almost anybody. It could be religious organizations, could be foreign powers, uh, it could be the tech giants themselves, you know, in the West, that would be like Facebook and um, maybe Google. Uh, do we really trust those? Well, some people do, some don't. And okay, maybe just uh, mention one or more of these things. Number 10 is perhaps quite important, online tribalism. So people are tending to break into tribes. I think in India, for example, you have a bit of a, a, um, a disjunct between liberals and conservatives from, from what I've seen. I don't know all the details, but from what I've seen, there seems to be a traditionalist versus modernist um, uh, tribal, shall we say, break up there. But every country has their own groups. The COVID-19 situation has seen people breaking up into like pro-vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, trust the science, you know, trust traditional medicine. So these are big problems. How do you solve these problems? We're seeing violence in some countries uh, I think in France, there was a big protest. In Australia, in my country, we had people on the streets. The government fined, but basically beat them up and fined them $5,500 each. That's a lot of money. Uh, people are arrested in our country now for not wearing a mask. So people are getting worried about the, what role that government and society and, and law play in all this. And do they have the authority to do this? Now, Okay, I'm going to move on to the next point. Now, this is actually my main argument in this talk. And since I'm not going to be able to say that much about it, I'm going to be quite quick. So the crisis in set, uh, sense making is multi factored So there's a lot of parts to it. But my argument is that uh, the authentic self can help, uh, help us to solve some of these problems. Now, what is the authentic self? So I, do, I do, uh, define this as the wiser or more grounded part of ourselves. And this is not experienced so much by people today in the era of the internet, but in traditional societies, people who meditated or um, people who had some sense of uh, mindfulness in nature, this experience of self is much more, much more common. So I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit in this talk about what I think the authentic self is, okay? Um, so I'll quickly go over some of the main points. You can also relate this to perhaps some traditional ideas, such as uh, in the Hindu tradition, or I believe it is, the idea of the Atman is transcends uh, the individualized or lower self. Um, you could probably correct me on that one. Uh, but in many traditions, there's the idea that there's an ego and perhaps a greater understanding of self. It could even be some spiritual or sacred sense of self. This is the, the authentic self that I'm really talking about. Uh, but the way I also frame it is that if people are grounded in this sense of self, it makes them less vulnerable to uh, uh, having their minds hijacked by, uh, shall we say, bad faith actors on the internet. Okay. <clears throat> now, what are the pillars of the authentic self? The pillar means the things that hold it up. So. Uh, I, I, my argument is that there's five parts to it. There's the idea of embodied presence. So that's being able to bring your mind present into the body in the present moment so that you're not scattered all over the place, right? Your mind is not in the past. It's not in the future. I also um, believe that the idea of an integrated intelligence is important. So the traditional, traditional wisdom uh, philosophies often told us that we were connected to something greater than ourselves. So this is what I call integrated intelligence. I think it's important that people start to work on this part of themselves. The third part is a cognitive responsibility. So this is the ability to assume responsibility for your emotions and the thoughts that arise in the mind. So this, again, is related to meditation and mindfulness. If you're able to bring your mind into presence, then you'll be better at this kind of thing. I also believe, number four, it's important to start to master some of the systems that we have. People need to become aware of how media works, 
how big tech works, um, how social media uh, can perhaps hijack your physiology. So I call this virtual intelligence, it's understanding how uh, internet systems and online systems work. And the fifth part I define is wise action. So once we connect with our own wisdom, then the actions that we take in the world and online can be more grounded more thoroughly in the authentic self. So this is my, my main argument, that uh, this authentic help, uh, self can help us to negotiate the crisis in sense-making. Okay, uh, so I, want, I think I'll just skip this part here because I've more or less gone over it. I'm just, this one just defines more deeply what cognitive responsibility is, okay? So um, I'll do, I will talk quickly about this one because this is something that uh, may not be quite clear to you. So the idea of integrated intelligence is related, related to the idea of the extended mind. Now, uh, this term, the extended mind, is used uh, in two ways on the internet today and in science. Version one is from neuroscience, basically. It's a mainstream idea. And it's the idea that our brains can be synchronized. So through uh, mirror neurons. So the neurons in my brain may connect with yours if we do something that helps us develop some sense of empathy, such as we might play a game together. Uh, or try to solve a, po a puzzle or a problem. Our brains will start to synchronize, okay? Uh, this is not the same thing as the second version. The first version has no concept of the extended mind, as in consciousness is reaching out of the body. It just happens to be that when we interact with the environment, our brains can synchronize with other brains through direct contact, basically. <clears throat> now, version two is a bit different. Uh, you can find this in some Western, current Western scientists like Rupert Sheldrake, Dean Radin, Stephen Schwartz. It's, this is a common idea in India as well, I know. Um, this, this is the idea that uh, mind extends beyond the body. So there's a non-local intelligence, and this is not a mainstream idea, okay? I think this is a very important idea. I believe this is a valid idea, and it's, I think I believe it's important for us to start to reconnect with our bodies, because both of these versions of integrated intelligence uh, say so it's very important to listen to your body because it's through the body that we start to connect with the feelings and the wisdom of, um, of that kind of integrated intelligence. No matter which version you believe in, both schools believe that uh, accessing your own wisdom and uh, feelings in your body are important. Okay. Uh, okay, now here I was gonna talk a little bit about some of the research into the extended mind, okay? I'm not gonna to say too much about this, except uh, mention one or two of the researchers in this area. Now, there's a guy called uh, Tom Froess, I think that's how you pronounce it. He works in the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in, in Japan. And he has done research on neutral, uh, neural synchronization, which is the first version of integrated intelligence. Now, what he says is this research very clearly shows that we need to change the way we think of minds and brains. So this yellow uh, writing here is really the part that I want to emphasize. And this is what he says. And he says, we propose that the boundaries of the conscious mind could also be subject to constant renegotiation during an individual's interaction with his or her environment and with others, pointing to a mechanism that nearly binds us together and opens us up to an extended conscious mind in social interaction. So basically what he's saying is that all our minds are connected, uh, not through uh, non-local intelligence, but simply because our brains are wired that way. There's some mechanism in the brain that when we connect with people, it, it, they, our brains fire in the same way, okay? If you wanna read this paper, it's in uh, the journal Neuroscience of Consciousness, okay? That's all I'll say about that. So just to re, uh, rehash my idea, my idea of sense-making and how to rise above sense-making is based on five areas. We develop the authentic self, a more genuine sense of self. We develop our integrated or intuitive intelligence. We uh, develop embodied presence. That's the idea of bringing our mind into the present moment in the body. 
we develop cognitive responsibility, which means that we can be responsible for our thoughts and emotions and feelings rather than projecting them out onto the internet, right? And creating chaos in the world. We also need to master the systems of the internet to understand media and uh, internet systems, big tech and so on. And then we have to take wise actions based on our understanding. It isn't enough to have intuition. We then need to put it in the world and to act on it. So that's, that's my basic argument in summary. Now, okay, let's just see if I can go to the next page. So the question then is, can the, the approach that I'm talking about help us um, solve this big problem in sense making? Can it be, uh, be a part of it? Okay. Uh, I'll just move on from this one. Uh, as I said, this whole idea does have parallels with traditional spiritual traditions, including in Asia, Taoism, Buddhism, uh, Sufi, and so on. It's also a part of popular teachings uh, that you'll find in some Western, you know, modern teachers. Who also, of course, drew their inspiration from Indian and Chinese and uh, um, Islamic traditions. People like uh, Eckhart Tolle and Ryan Holiday. Maybe you've heard of some of these people. Uh, futurists like me are also talking about this. So the last point I have on this page there, uh, in, two, uh, in 2020, I wrote a paper um, about this. You can follow this up in the, uh, the reference page at the end of this talk if you want, okay? So I think Asia is actually well-placed to play an important role in solving this problem because of the traditions, the, the traditional introspective traditions that exist in India, uh, in China, uh, many of the cultures around, the Confucian cultures in Japan, um, and then almost everywhere in Asia. So these are important. So I think, I think Asia can play a very big part in this. Okay. Okay, so um, let me move on to the next one. I'm just trying to read a little message here, but we'll get rid of it. Now, I'm just going to tell you a bit about critical future studies. So I'm a futurist, okay, a certain kind of futurist. So what, what is someone like me uh, doing interested in these kind of ideas? So I'll ex quickly explain to you what critical future studies are. If you're interested in this field, you can follow up online as well, okay? Now, <clears throat> my page is freezing. So it's an academic discipline. You can find it in various universities in Asia, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, Japan, Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, South Korea, Malaysia. There are some in India. I know some Indian futurists. Iran, Pakistan. There are some major international bodies that you can join, okay, um, which I won't mention here. But you can join those organizations. They're professional organizations. They have standards, okay. So it's not just something that I'm making up. Maybe some of you know what the future studies uh, field and uh, discipline is. So basically, critical future studies is not just about trying to predict the future. So that's a bit too passive. So we want to analyze the way we're thinking about it and then try to change it to some agreed future that we believe is preferable, something that we want to happen. For example, if this problem with sense making just keeps going the way it is without us moving in and trying to change it, it could become a, it's already a big problem. We need to somehow intervene and find ways to change it. And by using our own wisdom and coming together and engaging with each other, if we can't do that. We may have a fragmentation of, of uh, the nation state system and move back into a less, I, do, I hate to use the word globalized. Uh, globalization can have a positive meaning and a negative meaning, but in the positive sense of people working together in different countries, if we don't solve this problem, that we may have a fragmentation or splitting up of cooperation. It's already starting to happen. So what are some useful ideas in future studies? These are some that I pick out, right? Now, the first idea is that there are many possible futures, not just one. This is very important. So we can agree, I hope, that there's more than one way to create a future or more than one goal we can have as to where we want to go. There are futures that we can think about that are very different, not, not just about technology, okay? If the way we think about the future is only about technology and economics, that's a very narrow way to think of the future. This is, these are what I call money and machines futures, 
where we, we focus too much on technology and materialism and we lose touch with our spirit. So we need to think in many different ways. Now, the future isn't set. It can be changed. That is a fundamental premise of most futures. Not, not everybody agrees with that, by the way. I know that. In some traditions, people believe the future is set. But I would like personally to think that we can intervene and make the future the way that we would prefer to see it, uh, with our own inner wisdom. Okay. The fourth concept is uh, we can talk about th uh, three different kinds of futures. The possible future, this is what might happen. The probable future, this is what will probably happen unless we step in and do something. And then there's the preferred future. So this is what we would like to happen. So there may be a, a difference between the first two and the third one. So our goal as futurists is to try to get people to work together to create a future that they agree is good and right for the, all the people and the planet and the children and nature and so on. So the main point of the future is not just to predict it, but to uh, analyze it and try to shape it. So they're, they're the five key concepts that we have in future studies. Okay. I'm just going to tell you very quickly about one futurist. Uh, his name is Sohail Inaitala. He was actually my PhD supervisor when I was in the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia when I did my doctorate. And uh, a lot of the ideas that I talk about actually come from his, from his work, or at least were inspired by his work. Okay? Uh, he was born in Pakistan, but he went to the USA when he was six. And he came to Australia when he was probably about 40 or something like that. He's about 60 or so now, okay? Uh, he likes to talk about deep futures. So futures that are, you know, not just about technology and capitalism, but a broader, more spiritual way of looking at the future. One that satisfies the heart and the mind. Okay, uh, I think I might just skip this little part here, okay? <coughs> now, one futures method that Sahail talks about is called causal layered analysis. And this is a way that we can think about a problem that's happening into the future, such as sense-making problems, how to make sense of the world, and uh, to deepen it, to think about it more deeply. So there's four parts of this. So when we think of a problem, we can look at four parts. Now, the first part is basically the surface. So we just look at the surface and we can describe what's happening, okay? But this is not very, not very useful. It's just descriptive. And basically, if all we do is describe it, we can't change it. We can't think deeply. The second level is looking at all the systems that exist within a problem. Society, politics, policies of governments, technological problems, economic, economic systems, um, ideological systems as well. So when we start to analyze these and look at how they're affecting the problem, uh, then we're looking more deeply. But even beyond that, we can look at the worldview, the way people think. Uh, paradigms, which are systems of knowledge, which are embedded within a particular discipline, such as science or even social sciences. Uh, some people use the, the concept of paradigms for more than that. In, in its traditional use, it was mostly for sciences, but people use it for a lot of other areas now. But anyway, I won't talk about that. That's not important. The last thing is to look, look at myths and metaphors. Now, a myth, a myth basically means the stories that underpin what we do, the narrative. Um, so what is the place of humankind in nature? Is it like a hero going out to conquer nature? If we, if we use that metaphor, that story, then maybe we dominate nature to the point where we destroy it and we don't develop the right relationship with it. So that's just one example of how a story or a metaphor may underpin the way that we uh, talk about talk about something, a problem. Okay. Um, if anyone wants to tell me how long I have left uh, at some point, or if they want me to finish up, then just tell me. Focus problems. So what are some of the problems that we have with the collapse of sense making? So I'm gonna tell you four, four problems that I think are central to this. Okay. So the collapse of sense making is actually, I would say, the first part of the problem. And um, this is more or less what I just told you. So I'm not going to go over this again. The main problem here is that we're having trouble making sense of the world. 
governments need to act and be more nimble. Like Klaus Schwab, who's the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, Forum has pointed out that governments now have to work far more quickly than they used to. <clears throat> the government can't go to a meeting and, for four days and think about how uh, the 911 crisis uh, affects America in 2001, because if four days later, you know, the, the New York City is burnt down. They have to act fast. Nowadays, the information is so fast, if the government doesn't do something, doesn't say something about it, the internet will beat them to it. And by the time they get to it, there could be chaos in the world. So sense making is a problem. There's a lot of distrust. You might know this guy, the picture here, David Icke. He's a, so this is about conspiracy theory culture. And this is a controversial issue. We're finding that lots of conspiracy theories arise uh, in many uh, locations. What is the difference between a conspiracy theory and maybe a valid theory of knowledge? Well, I would say the main difference is that a valid theory of knowledge tends to be uh, problematic. It, it suggests that we don't know everything. Um, it, may, it points out the things that we don't know. Secondly, it's not so emotional. Conspiracy theories tend to be very angry and, and um, distrustful. A more legitimate way of looking at, say, a problem which has multiple aspects we don't understand is to try to keep calm and try to make sense of it and delay our sense of certainty. Because the truth is, there may be a hell of a lot of things we don't know. And that's just the way it is sometimes. When who really knows um, what's happening in multiple contexts with, uh, well, even the beginning of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. There's controversy over whether it started in Wuhan, China. Uh, some Chinese think it started in America and they, they brought it to China, okay. So, um, we try to work from evidence as best as possible to understand those things. And, okay, I won't go through this one. Now, this point here is about weaponization. So ideas, even very good ideas, can be used by all kinds of people in a way that has an agenda. And this can be quite destructive if you're used in the wrong way. There are so many examples of this. Now, almost any idea that you can think of say, including um, use vaccines or not use vaccines, all these ideas can be used by somebody to try to gain power over other people. For example, you could use the idea of uh, mandating vaccines, I'm not saying this is true, to control populations. Some people, uh, mostly conspiracy theorists, would say that this is happening. On the other side, anti-vaxxers might say, well, um, those people are trying to use uh, use that um, uh, situation in order to I don't know, control populations and maybe even to reduce the world's population, something like that. So these ideas can be taken by people and groups and used to try to gain some sort of foothold in people's minds. So this is what we call weaponization. Really good ideas can be weaponized. The idea of racism and anti-racism, uh, immigration, can be used in a positive and a negative way. Uh, like in the United States, for example, people who might be against too much immigration can use immigration problems to try to force policy on governments. Government parties uh, like the Democrats and Republicans can use that idea to try to gain power into the population. So these are complex ideas and sometimes the answers are not always known. Okay. Is there somebody saying something? So please continue. Mm. Okay, uh, there's some, a couple of questions here which I can answer at the end, right, okay. Um, okay, this issue too, I'll go through this very quickly. Computational rationality is a term that I developed. This basically means that <clears throat> people's minds are becoming increasingly, and ways of knowing and thinking are increasingly uh, embedded in machines in uh, technology, mobile phones, and so on. And this creates a problem with disembodiment. So we lose connection with the body. And when we lose connection with the body, we lose, lose connection with our deep intuitions. And that makes us more susceptible, I claim, this is my argument, to being manipulated. Okay. 
Uh, now I've already mentioned this idea of a money and machines futures, which is futures which are too focused on capitalism, materialism, technology. Now the opposite to that is something I call a deep future. I've just made this little simple dichotomy between deep future and money and machines futures, just to show what I believe is a preferable way to start to think about the future. So nothing wrong with technology in itself. Uh, it's nice to have material things. Um, we don't want impoverished people. We don't want poor people, you know, but we also want to respect the spiritual and psychological well-being of people. We want to respect nature. Um, we want to diversify power so that more people in our populations are being able to have power in a responsible way. Okay. Again, this is, these are big problems. I'm not saying I have all the answers, but ideally in deep futures, uh, we start to think about the future in more than just ways of using technology. Um, okay. The idea here that I've got with e bills is a very common one on the internet and that algorithms will tend to take us down a tunnel. And once we're kind of in that tunnel, it's very difficult to get yourself out of um, these algorithms and the way they direct you into very specific forms of information and very specific stories. For example, if I go onto YouTube and I, I watch a video about cats, if I don't change the cookies, I'll get a whole heap of videos about cats. But that's fine if I just want to look at cats, but maybe I want to look at dogs as well. So this is a, this is a common problem. Most of us realize uh, this problem these days. So what do we do about these problems? The internet um, is kind of taking hold of people's minds. We've got conspiracy theories. Well, censorship, we can start censoring people more, you know, which is what we're doing basically. But that's not likely, my argument is that's not likely to shift the way that people use their bodies or deepen their consciousness. So I think it's not enough in itself, okay? The system is still driven by what I call utopian values. This is the money and machines values. Even if you stop people from talking about, you know, um, vaccines are bad, even if you cut those people off, it still doesn't change the system of overuse of technology. So it needs to be more than about censorship, I believe. We need to start looking at the way we use technology as well. And um, we need to reconnect with our uh, intuitive world. Tribalism and conflict, we know that this is a problem. I've kind of mentioned it, so I'll just quickly, um, I don't think I'll talk too much about this one. I'll just keep going. But we know there's a split, for example, in America between Democrats and Republicans, it's a very bad one. Um, so I'll just move on to step four. Pessimism is another one. This doomsday, what are called doomsdayism. So a lot of people are, are losing hope. The internet tends to be very negative. There's a lot of bad information. Some of the information may be correct, by the way. I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong. Uh, climate change, uh, COVID situation, you know, people have uh, been locked up, losing loved ones. You know, it's natural that people become depressed and a lot of people are becoming depressed, okay. Uh, but this was before, also happening before COVID situation, okay. Part of the problem is that we have a, a biological predisposition towards negativity. So if I tell you 10 good things about yourself, okay, I say, maybe I say you're smart, you're pretty, you're handsome, um, <clears throat> you've got really nice clothes and I like your family. And then I say, um, I'm sorry, but you've got bad breath. Which one of those things will you probably remember when you go home? You probably remember that I, I said you had bad breath. This is negativity bias. And it's, it's been well established in, uh, in science and psychology. So we tend, we tend to remember uh, negative things and the news systems and media and social media know that. They know that if you put something bad on the internet and spin it in a bad way, people will click. If it bleeds, it leads. So this is um, leading to increasing levels of uh, negativity on the internet. A good example of this is the voluntary human extinction movement. And this is a group that says that we should just kill ourselves and just get rid of the humans and that way the planet will be all nice again. Um, well, maybe they can start with themselves and uh, set a good example. That's, that's my um, kind of humorous take on it. Somehow I don't think they're gonna do that, but uh, I don't think it's a good solution either. Really. You have to become smarter than what we are. Okay, what are some useful tools? 
Um, how long do I have left? I'll, okay, I'll just mention, I'll finish off with this, okay? What are some useful tools that we can use to uh, do the kinds of things that I'm, I'm mentioning? Okay. So uh, one tool, a lot of these tools come from traditional spiritual traditions um, uh, that are in, the, in, in our wise traditions. It's just a matter of whether we choose to use them. Now, the idea of noticing is, uh, can help us with cognitive responsibility. So we develop a kind of a witnessing for our mind. So as thoughts and feelings move out, we notice what they are without judgment. And this helps us to take responsibility. In order to really master this, though, you have to have some kind of mindfulness or meditative tradition or practice. Otherwise, it, and you probably need someone to help you to learn it if you don't know. Okay, so you notice, noticing your thoughts and feeling, feelings and being able to be responsible for them. Uh, one way to do this is by just focusing on your breath. Okay, just take, taking three breaths. <coughs> Another way is bringing your attention just onto an object that's closer to you and just focusing your uh, attention gently onto something. It could be a, a cup or a glass like this one in the picture. It could be some flowers. Something natural is really good to do this. Um, don't use abstract things like books or, or things with a lot, a lot of words because it tends to take you into the head. Okay, so bringing your attention onto something. Another good uh, practice is finding your trigger points. So if you go onto the internet and you find something triggers you, okay, maybe you're a fan of um, Joe Biden, for example. I know there were some out there. Um, and you see somebody criticizing Joe Biden. He's an old, you know, who doesn't know what he's talking about. And you, this triggers you into anger. So the, the key here is knowing what triggers yourself and learning uh, what they are, okay? Now, once you've learned what your trigger points are, you can then use meditation and visualization to imagine yourself in that situation and choosing an alternative uh, response. Instead of you know, putting something onto the internet, which is um, stupid, you know, you're probably a Trump supporter. That's why you don't like Joe Biden. You know, go and jump in the lake. You can develop a better response and uh, a more mindful response. And it also helps you to understand the way your mind works. So it helps your own spiritual development. So finding your own trigger point and working with it is actually a good way to use the internet to become smarter about yourself. Okay, we won't get to that one. Rituals are also very good. You can develop rituals um, that will help you. For example, before you go on the internet, you can have a very simple ritual like tapping on the desk several times, maybe slower than that. Or, or breathing several times. So a mini ritual can help you get into a more present uh, focus of mind and can help you be more responsible and more grounded and more in the intuitive body. And my argument is that if you can do that, you're less likely to get triggered and pulled into somebody else's agenda or somebody trying to make you angry so that you can then go and do something they want, like buy their product or go to their website. Another way, is just to tune out and turn off. Some people choose this. Okay, I'm only going to go on the internet for no more than one hour a day. I'm not going, uh, what I do is I normally don't go on the internet till at least lunchtime if I can. And no, no text messaging. So we can self, um, how can we say, we can uh, discipline ourselves. Okay, I think we're kind of ran out of time here, right? So um, I, won't, I won't go up. Uh, I can share this PPT with you. There's a few more things here about how we might be able to apply this in society, okay? But uh, I won't go into it because we're kind of out of time. I've been talking for a long time and you probably don't want to hear me talking too, too much though. <coughs> how about I end there? And um, before I end, I guess I will just give you, uh, there's some references at the end here if you want to see. And here's a little bit about myself. Uh, this bridge here is in Zhuhai. It's built between Zhuhai and Hong Kong. It's about 50 kilometers long, I think, okay? So no, that's where I live. Okay, so maybe I can try to um, uh, answer a question or two. Is that okay? Yeah.
thank you uh, professor antoni for your wonderful deliberation uh, now i would like to invite uh, dr nupur uh, for go for a, a short uh, remark on professor antoni's talk then we are uh, uh, starting the question answer session over to you dr nupur yeah thank you dr rudra i think i'm clearly audible yes yes i can hear you yeah okay so uh, a very good evening uh, to um, professor antony and all the participants over here who are listening so sir we are really grateful that you have come here and given a very unique deliberation about uh, making sense in the 21st century uh, because uh, we live in an era where uh, everything is digital everything is web based and here we don't have the opportunity to meet in the real life because earlier we did had this uh, web concept but today in this pandemic we are in a very confusing state of mind where we don't know what to trust and what not to trust what is real what is unreal i think sir mm. you have given a very wonderful explanation on this particular issue of uh, this uh, pandemic and how uh, we as people in different different aspects of life that may be education that may be news that may be many other social aspects economic aspects or political aspects where we are affected and we also uh, do not have uh, do not have that sense of thinking because thinking some way is threatened and by highlighting very key informative points and theories and very uh, great examples that are quite uh, rampant in this world and how things are going on and moving on in this today's world so i think sir it was really a great uh, great enlightening session for the entire audience over here when you explained about how do we get rid or how do we make a sense today in this world like you have suggested a lot of steps like um, how we should uh, how we, we should go for meditation and other practices and giving the example of uh, buddha and that is really very very much relevant today so thank you so much sir for highlighting us on the very important issues and important points and i think everybody today uh, the students the uh, other people who are the participants who are eager to listen to you may be very much uh, grateful to you because of this particular lecture that you have given and uh, tried us to know about the value of uh, making uh, our mind authentic or real or to develop our own self that is how it is very very important thank you so much sir well thank you for having me thank you so much uh, dr nupu for the wonderful remark uh, so let us take the questions uh, professor marcus uh, sk imran kadir is asking by multiple measures we are healthier more prosperous and better educated than ever but are we using our expanded power for good do we as a society live by values that make us proud in 21st century So the last part, I got the first part. Uh, we're more prosperous. Uh, we have more, perhaps more. Uh, most of us, anyway. Many of us, not everybody, has more than we used to have. I agree. That's with it. There's much data to back that up. And maybe I think the second part was, if I'm correct, we're not using our understanding in a way that's maybe ideal or the best way. Is that the question? Yes, please. Okay. If okay, if I understand the question, I I would agree with that. Um, the the thing is, when we have things like there's a, there's an experiment done with uh, with monkeys, for example. <clears throat> you give a, a a monkey an apple, and it will be, will be very happy, right? Uh, you give a, a monkey two apples and take one away, it's not happy. It becomes angry. So sometimes we forget. Uh, what we have so it just seems to be human nature that when we get we, we've been given a lot by our ancestors really when you look at life in say 1800 the average lifespan was about 35 in developed country well more developed countries in indigenous cultures it was more like about 
that's because nearly half the population died before the age of five. People, doctors didn't wash their hands because they didn't know about germs. Uh, you know, so we have a lot more of air conditioning. You know, if you live in a place like India or Zhuhai, if you have air conditioning, or at least a fan, electric fan, that's really good. But yeah, we have to, I, I believe that gratitude, learning gratitude is a very important part of, of life. So none of us has everything. And some people have more than others is true. Inequality is a problem, it's true. But I really believe that it's important that we, as best we can, uh, learn to be grateful for what we have. And from that base, we can then perhaps choose wise actions and actions that are more spontaneously generous. Because when we feel happy and grateful, we tend to be more generous to other people. So my, my take is that, you know, we have to, cultivate our mind to be present and to be and to be and to be grateful for what we have and uh, that's only one aspect of the problem you know it's not it's not all the solution these, these problems are multifaceted all I'm saying is that I believe this is a part of the problem that we could work on uh, thank you Anthony. Uh, uh, this question is from my side uh, sir, the, the question is how are you living, uh, that uh, you are living in China, that my question is how China deals with this pandemic situation and what kind of uh, educational um, constructiveness was provided by the government of China to the subjects and um, how that uh, you are living in China, that what, what kind of situation is happening and how the people of China is making sense in this uh, pan pandemic era. Okay, there were several, several aspects of that question. I should, I should have a pen here somewhere because, okay, the, the situation in China, basically, in most parts of China, the, the, after the initial outbreak in Wuhan, in, <coughs> which is January of last year, it's been handled very well after the initial, they kind of messed up the initial um, response, just quietly, you know, I don't want to criticize the government or anything. Um, but the structures that are in place now work really well. There's no mandated vaccine here, surprisingly. You know, in like in America, Joe Biden just passed an uh, executive order saying that people in companies of more than 100 employees have to be uh, vaccinated by, by law. They're trying to put that law into place. This is not a law in China at the moment. In fact, I've tried to get vaccinated here. It's not easy to get vaccinated, believe it or not. It can be done, but you've got to be very persistent. There isn't much COVID around. In my town of one and a half million people, Zhuhai, we've had a very few cases actually. There were about a hundred cases at one time uh, early last year. We get one or two cases every now and again. In the nearby cities like Tianjin, which has like 15 million people, they sometimes get half a dozen cases. As soon as they get a case, what they do is they then make mandate that everyone has to wear a mask, uh, has to, everyone has to get tested. So if there's any outbreak in my town, I have to go and get a test to see if I have uh, COVID. If I, if I have a, a barcode on my phone, to do, so to go anywhere, I have to show that I don't have COVID, right? So it seems to work well. So the coding part, I think, is a pretty good system. Um, and it's quite easy to do with a, with, a, with a mobile phone. It's not perfect, but it, it seems to be working quite well. Chinese people seem to be quite obedient. Um, I haven't seen any protests here. Um, so what was the other part of the problem? Um, in China, uh, the people here, yeah, they, I think it's, people are pretty okay with what's going on. It, it seems to be a lot better than some countries. Uh, the, the government's becoming very conservative here. Uh, they're kind of cracking down on freedom of information and things like that, kicking out some of the foreign uh, language schools. These are some problems that are occurring. Uh, they say that's because they want to uh, make sure that people don't have too much stress, like for their kids. But yeah, so there are some negative things. They can control information here much better than in, say, Australia. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why they do better, because information control. Uh, basically, an authoritarian system, 
people have to do what they're told. So for this kind of problem, China's system is better. It may not be better for some other things, but for COVID, I think it's a good system. Uh, thank you. Another question is uh, from Professor Pramod Ranjan Punda. What is the central meaning of mind? Uh, is simply not located in mind. Some deep philosophy are expected in this single sentence. Actually, what is the meaning of this line? Uh, what line was that? He quoted that. He's asking the what is the central meaning of mind. Professor Ponda, are you here? Please ask him, uh, ask Professor Anthony directly your question. Well, hello, I can hello, sir. Hello, oh, sir. Yes. My, myself, Pramod, sir, speaking. Hello, sir. Yes. I heard a sentence in your speech that mind is simply not located in the brain. Ah, yes. So, what is the intrinsic uh, meaning of that simple sentence, sir? The sentence is uh, kindly elaborate, sir. Okay. So this is an idea that I've been exploring for about 20 years. And I know it's not a mainstream view. I know that if you go to uh, most mainstream science, especially neuroscience centers, they will not like this idea. So I'm just sharing what I, I believe from my, based on my experience and how I've worked with other people, my experience as a meditator. Um, when I, uh, you know, I'll share with you quite openly. When I was 26 years old, I started meditating and uh, I had a lot of experiences, including the, the uh, experience of the opening of the third eye, um, which is how I experienced it. So I started to be able to sense things which I could not explain by the localized model of consciousness. The only way I could explain that experience was by um, believing that mind is, part, is not located in my head, but is connected with the world, connected with other people, um, it transcends in some sense space and time. Now, I'm not the only person that believes this, even though it's not mainstream. I mentioned Rupert Sheldrake, of course, Dean Radin, Stephen Schwartz. In India, I'm, there's probably a million people that have this idea because it is part of traditional Indian culture, I believe, if I understand it correctly um, as well. And many of the traditions in India, in, in Taoism, in China, you know, Lao Tzu basically said that you could know the world without leaving your own room, which tends to suggest that there's some aspect of mind which is not localized in the body. Now, what is the, what is the, the mechanistic basis of that theory? How does it function mechanically? I don't know. We don't have a, a, an accepted scientific explanation for how that works. Most people probably working in mainstream science don't even want to think about it, but you know, there are some models, as you probably know, I, I don't really like a lot of them, like the quantum physics ideas. It's not really an explanation. Um, but some people, you know, posit these kind of ideas. So I, this is my, my take on it. This is what I believe based on my experience. I've worked with other people who have the same experiences. And it's very interesting to work with people who do not think that your mind is separate because then it opens up a whole realm of interactions and experiences that you wouldn't normally have. But I'll just end it there, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Ponda, and thank you, Professor Anthony. So one last question. Uh, sir, uh, what is your um, views on uh, the, the lack of trust in media and uh, um, the fake news uh, is a uh, spreading in social medias and how it impacts the present generation and basically the kids and uh, what, what is basically the impact on the society and how the present human beings in 21st century will deal with these problems. Yeah, well, that's what my talk is about. I don't have all the answers. The, my, my, my solution is one, only one level of the problem, right? I suggested people work on themselves to ground themselves in a sense of self, an authentic sense of self. If you know who you are and what your focus is and what you feel to be true for you, then you have a grounding in which you go in and, and interact with media and social media, but at least you start by knowing first who you are as a person. 
If you don't have that grounding, you're going to be very amenable to other uh, manipulation. Now, there are other, other levels of the problem, the technological level. Um, what kind of systems do we need to create? What kind, how should we uh, moderate the internet or censor people? Who do we censor? Who decides who censors somebody? And what happens when to the people who refuse to be censored? These are big problems. Now for young people coming into the world today, my, my hope is that they would, that we would teach them to be grounded in themselves. Because as you know, the younger you get exposed to technology, the more your brain will tend to be um, wired for that kind of experience. So I would suggest that as we're learning technology, we also keep grounded in the, in the body. Um, yeah, it's a problem because if once we lose trust in the institutions, if you don't trust Google or whatever your local search engine is, if you don't trust the New York Times or your local newspaper, you don't you think the news readers are lying or at least they're not trustworthy, if you think the banks are not trustworthy, that the universities are teaching us rubbish, you know, a lot of people believe that. I mean, what, what, what do you do about that? So um, I believe we need to, to develop emotional intelligence at least. So at least, even if we don't understand the world, at least we have an understanding of ourselves. And from there, we can engage the world in a way that's responsive and at least grounded in some sort of emotional strength or sense of, uh, a sense of empowerment within ourselves. So when we see something that we don't know is true or not true, at least it doesn't have the effect of really unsettling us because we already know who we are. If we don't know who we are or what we believe in, then any, anything anybody says could disturb us quite deeply. So that's all I'll say about that. Thank you so much, sir. Um, now we have to be, uh, conclude uh, this session. Uh, thank you so much, Professor uh, Anthony, for joining us far from China. And we are very glad to host you today. Uh, uh, you are uh, uh, talking about uh, several issues like collapse uh, of trust in media and the institutions, fake news, weaponization issues, virtual reality. Uh, quasi religious movements this is a very important point that you have raised and uh, and another is case crisis computational warfare online tribalism and uh, critical thinking and also the uh, reflective uh, reading is also an important part of this uh, um, mm. this present situation yeah. and also you talk about uh, the authentic self that is your the uh, the self of attraction of the of your uh, powerpoint presentation that is self uh, uh, authentic self and how how it help to activate the problems associated with crisis and also uh, talk about the five pillars of authentic authentic self so, and throw light on the integrated intelligence and uh, um, extended uh, uh, mind and how neuroscience deal on it and the indications on neuro neural synchronization so um, it's a very very wonderful um, and thought provoking deliberation of sir marcus uh, i'd like to uh, inform our uh, audiences that professor marcus uh, have several books uh, uh, written by Professor Marcus, so I, I want to read some names of the books that uh, I hope that the books are very important and very progressive and uh, I suggest to read Professor Marcus that and one book is Champion of the Soul, uh, Master of the Mind. Another book is Extraordinary Mind, Integrated Intelligence and Future. Very important book. And the third book is Sa Sage of uh, Synchronicity. And uh, fourth is Discover Your Soul Templates, Four Steps for Awakening Integrated Intelligence. Uh, fifth is Trolls and Demons. Uh, sixth is Channel Your uh, Dissertation, Law of Attraction, The Mind Reader, uh, The Truth uh, About Karma, uh, Insufficient Data, and divine love and these are these these are very important and very um, beautiful books as i just uh, uh, read the reviews in uh, google and i suggested um, all our listeners and participants to 
uh, read uh, Professor Marcus. Uh, thank you, Professor Marcus, for joining us. It's a very uh, wonderful evening today. Now I'd like to thank our coordinating partners, Indian Institute of Management, Arvens University and Central University of Odisha, respected uh, director, Professor Mahadev Jaiswal, uh, Professor uh, Sanjay Naik, and Professor uh, um, Sarvat Kumar Palita, and our respected uh, uh, organizers, uh, Dr. Bikram Kesar Jena, director, Center for Adivasi Research and Development, and the conveners of this um, um, webinar and intellectual conference, Professor Chandi Prasad Nanda and uh, um, Professor Charudatta Panigrahi, and our team for uh, um, going hard work for this uh, uh, session. Uh, Dr. Nupur, uh, Dr. Neha Sarma, Dr. Shubham Das, Dr. Ghansyam Giri, Dr. Kamal Prasad Mahanti, Dr. Samuel Lima, and Jinmoy Kumar Sahu, Rasmi Sattati, and all. And at last, thank you all our audiences from YouTube and Facebook. And here, if you people uh, joining in the uh, Zoom. And thank you, Professor Marcus for joining, uh, linking you meet to Google meet. I, I, uh, it was the Dr. Vikram Jena, he told me that you were linking you meet to Zoom, Zoom meeting and the process I is very hard. Yes, yes, thank okay. you. And, okay. and thank you, thank you for joining us. And we are very much uh, anxious to go for a future engagement with us. Thank you. Okay, Somebody if you want to want the PBT, I'll give it to you, no problem. Thank you, thank you. Sir. Okay, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.